Hey there, Brainiacs. I'm Ali Astrocyte. Welcome back to Neurotransmissions. Science is the search for truth. Scientists everywhere are trying to understand universal facts about the way that our world works. But science is also an inherently human enterprise. It's impossible to separate the people who do science from the science itself. This week, we're gonna talk a little bit about how that human side of science can sometimes get in the way of discovering those objective facts. And we have a special guest this week who has some personal experience with that problem. Dr. Brian Keating is a professor of physics here at UCSD, where he studies the cosmic microwave background, essentially the echoes of the beginning of the universe. And he's studying that to try and understand the beginning of, well, everything. Dr. Keating is also the author of the new book, Losing the Nobel Prize, a story of cosmology, ambition, and the perils of science's highest honor. His book tells the story of his journey into physics and his study of the universe and how a mistake got in the way of a pretty perfect discovery. So Dr. Keating, tell us what led you to write this book? Well, this book is not written as a how-to guide on how to lose the Nobel Prize. <laughs> <laughs> Instead, it's written as sort of an insider's glimpse into what it's like to aspire to one of the greatest accomplishments in, in my field and sort of a cautionary tale. It's the story of, of trying to achieve the greatest glory and uh, examining the personal motivations why we scientists do the things that we do. But strange things happen when there are people pursuing, you know, a, an award that only three people can win. Dr. Keating explores this question through the context of the BICEP2 project, which was a major discovery that was made in 2014 that has since led to some controversy in the field. Could you give us a brief overview of what the BICEP2 project was trying to accomplish? So BICEP2 was an experiment. It was essentially a refracting telescope, not too similar from the way the human eye works. It uses lenses and detectors to make images of the sky, but unlike your eye, it makes maps of invisible light, light that we cannot see. And this light is called the cosmic microwave background radiation. What was the discovery that made these big waves? And what were the mistakes that were made that led up to that? Yeah, it's funny you should use the word waves because actually what we were looking for were waves of gravity. So these are invisible pulsations in the fabric of space-time. And these, these reverberations, we thought and were told if we were to detect them, they would be indicative of the first birth moments, the birth pangs of the Big Bang, as I mm -hmm. call it. And this would be a, a sure path to Nobel glory, among <laughs> other things. What happened? What went wrong? So it's interesting. People talk about the experiment and they wonder, you know, did you leave the lens cap on the telescope? <laughs> so no, we, we didn't leave the lens cap on the telescope. We actually didn't make a blunder whatsoever. When some people speak of our results, they talk about our results being disconfirmed, meaning that we have great confidence, even to this day, in the accuracy of the results measured themselves. However, the interpretation that we put forth for them, namely that they were indicative of this ultra-violent, rapid, explosive expansion of the universe in its first trillionth of a second, that interpretation had to be retracted because it turned out that what we saw was almost equally likely to be an imposter masquerading as the signal that we wish to see. When you're talking about the Big Bang, you're talking about the evolution of the universe, you're talking about sort of the grandest stakes of the cosmos. We have very high stakes in cosmology and there used to be a joke made by a famous, you know, very dour Russian Nobel laureate who said, cosmologists are often in error, but we're never in doubt. Mm. And I think, I think that kind of uh, exemplifies some of the hubris that we might have as cosmologists. As I understand it, what you do in biological sciences is dissect a lot of frogs, right? So, so you can dissect a frog after you have subjected it to ultraviolet light, or maybe you give it some sort of chemical. But in cosmology, we can't do an experiment on the universe at all. Mm. Uh, first of all, there's only one universe. So how do you have a control when the entire system under study is all that you have? And so that forces us to, to sort of sometimes overinterpret what we see because we have a natural tendency to want to pull out of the data maybe more than is available to actually be extracted. So in this case, from what I understand, essentially new data came out that showed that it was probably or could likely be dust, yes. essentially. It was just a, some dust that was in the way that just happened to be exactly the pattern yes. you were hoping for. We didn't have dust on the on the, on the instrument, on the, <laughs> yeah, on the lens. Yeah, space, space actually, dust. Actually, yes, yeah, so we detected space dust, which yeah. was pretty cool, uh, because actually, if you think about it, the entire planet is space dust. Mm -hmm. The blood that flows through our veins is space dust, in a sense. Uh, and what we saw, we had been uh, alert to, and we knew that we had to worry about the component, this this component of cosmic dust, which is dust not from the Big Bang, but from the explosion of stars in our own galaxy. The data that came out of the BICEP2 project was very exciting, and obviously it was something that you've been looking for for a long time and really been hoping to confirm your hypothesis. Do you think that if the Planck 2 data had not come out, 
when it did, do you think you would ever have realized that your data might not be exactly what you thought it was? Yeah, I think I think we would have. I mean, the field of cosmology is ultra competitive. There's e extremely high stakes with millions, maybe billions of dollars riding on experimental research. And, and so, yes, there's actually 12 different experiments that are pursuing the signal to this day. Mm -hmm. So the ultimate, I think, answer to your question is yes, because the, all these experiments kept going and in fact got a second wind after the BICEP2 result uh, came to its <laughs> unfortunate denouement in some yeah. sense. Given the more recent data that's come out that has sort of deconfirmed the results, is it possible that the BICEP2 data was correct? Yes, that's a good point. So it could be that we were correct and then we uh, had a retraction of the interpretation that we had, but someone later on could come. The exciting part about science is that <laughs> someone can come along who's a lot smarter than us and find, well, actually, they were right when they thought they were wrong. Is it possible to do science totally objectively? And if it's not, how do we deal with that? The answer is yes and no. So if when, when humans are involved, I think the answer is, is no, uh, with a but, because <laughs> I think they can employ uh, techniques in terms of computer simulations, artificial intelligence, machine learning. There have been new classes of stars, uh, supernova, a, things have been discovered using purely machine methods that are completely objective. And mm -hmm. I think that that's a huge development that no one would have forecasted, uh, you know, 100 years ago. I don't think that there's a way to truly be fundamentally objective. I think mm -hmm. you can strive for it. But as you said, objectivity is also sometimes influenced and it's a virtuous or vicious cycle depending on how you look at it because policy can influence scientific uh, uh, research directions and vice versa. So a lot of your book and your work so far has sort of come to, to think very critically about the effects of bias on how science is performed and how science is reported. And I think this raises a really interesting question of, you know, science we want to believe is helping us understand truth about the universe, but it is influenced by our bias. So how can we uh, communicate that bias to the public when we share our research without decreasing public trust in science? I think it's a big challenge. I mean, when you look at saying when these discoveries are made and they're built up and, and even entities like NASA will require like a press conference for something. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's very hard to, to get up with, you know, 30 people at the press club in Washington, DC, hundreds of people in the audience. <laughs> We found nothing. <laughs> so I think to quantify ignorance is a beautiful part of science. And actually, we get to spend a lot of time doing it in my field because mm -hmm. the level of of confidence, the signal to noise that we have is necessarily small. We're tracking photons that have traveled for 14 billion years to get into our telescope. Mm -hmm. So you always have to quantify how little you know, your yeah. ignorance of what you're studying. One of the big pieces that seems to be missing, both from scientific education and from the public perception of scientists, is creativity. Mm. Actually, you and I have to be very creative in what we do. And people think stereotypically a scientist is this, you know, person wearing a lab. I'm sure you wear a lab coat. I, I don't wear a lab coat. Okay, one of us has to, right? <laughs> uh, but on the other hand you know, you're also extremely creative because you're thinking and your job as a grad student is to come up with knowledge that no human being has ever known before. And I think that's that's a privilege and it's a huge responsibility as well. And I don't think we convey either one particularly, uh, you know, genuinely. Well, I hope that efforts like this and, you know, like your book and like our channel and talking to scientists can help people understand that we are trying to approach these carefully, but uh, we are just like anyone subject to our own mistakes. That's right. I mean, I think that the science, the word in Greek means knowledge, mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean wisdom. So what is wisdom? Wisdom is what you get out of the lab. Mm -hmm. And it's what the, you make with your relationships, the connections that you make, the people that you will mentor. The word in, in Russian for scientist, and I've had this confirmed, I'm not Russian, I don't speak <laughs> Russian, I don't, but I know that the word scientist in Russian translates into one who was taught. And that kind of exemplifies what science means to me. It means I am a mentor and you are a mentor uh, and you have a mentor, but your job after this is to mentor as well. You can't call yourself a scientist unless you teach. And I think that burden, whether it be going out into the world, the community, the university or industry, mm -hmm. that's the responsibility. And we don't do a good enough job teaching how to communicate the creativity and the, and the, and the challenge of what we do as scientists. Mm -hmm. So do you think that accolades like the Nobel Prize are a necessary part of inspiring inspiring people to pursue science. I mean, you, jo you joke that you did it for the money, but <laughs> science is not exactly a super high paying career yeah. in academic research. Yeah, um, it, 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 I think at best, after going through the sort of uh, conflict and, and, and catharsis of my 
own being nominated for a Nobel Prize and nominating other people for the Nobel Prize, that that catharsis has led me to a realization that at best the Nobel Prize could be sort of a harmless you know, thing where it doesn't really hurt people, although it can, because I think it, it actually distorts the, the perception of the public that, oh, well, they're, they're just these eggheads, mostly white males that win it, and that's what, sci that's what a scientist is. And then when the public sees that as the exemplar of what science is, I think it can have a negative effect. I don't have any, there are actually prizes that are worth three, four times as much as the Nobel Prize, mm -hmm. um, but they have nowhere near the prestige and the, and, the, and the fame attributed to them. Yeah. So what are you hoping that people will take away from your book and from the experience that you had with this project and its uh, reversal? I think that, that the ultimate goal of looking to science as if it's a sport, as if it's the Olympics, and, and you have to get to the gold. And I was told very early on, if you don't get the Nobel Prize, you won't get tenure. I was told wow, that oh, really? only, yeah, <laughs> I, know, I had one of my early readers of the book uh, tell me that she dropped out of uh, studying astronomy as an undergraduate, a very prestigious school, because her father told her that you weren't a good scientist unless you won the Nobel Prize. And she didn't think she could win it. And she was basically telling me she wished that she had my book 10 years ago <laughs> to give to her father. So I think that people take away from it that it's really not this that in some sense the, the Nobel Prize has been elevated to the status of almost like an idol you know that we we worship and and that the people that win it are so far beyond who we are no they're not they're people they're my friends they're 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 people that you know people that lead your institution right mm -hmm. and they're human beings and what what happens in science should be appreciated not for the gilded destination in Stockholm but it should be the science the pleasure of the journey itself where can people find out more about you and your work, and in particular, more about your book? Okay, so my book's available wherever books are sold, on, <laughs> on, online and, and, and elsewhere. I am available on Twitter, and uh, I also have a website, which is briankeating.com. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Keating. It's been Keating. my pleasure. Thank Again, you, Allie. Dr. Keating's book is called Losing the Nobel Prize. You can check out his website and a link to his book in the description to this video. Thanks for watching this episode of Neurotransmissions. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if you liked it, hit that thumbs up button and make sure you subscribe for the next time we get to talk to another awesome scientist. Thanks so much for watching. I'm Allie Astrocyte. Over and out.